What's going on at Reading? Yesterday there were reports that the club were about to be sold to a British businessman, William Storey, for £50 million. According to the article yesterday in one of the papers, Storey agreed to clear the club's debts of £50 million, pledged to invest in the playing squad when a transfer embargo is lifted. Reading, though, uh, sent out a statement last night in which they clarified that there is currently no agreement in place with any party and that no single individual or entity has exclusivity in this process. So let's find out what is happening by speaking to the man who's been linked with the potential purchase of the club. Uh, William Storey joins us live on the show now. Thank you very much for talking to us and welcome to the programme. Thanks for having me. Um, just tell us what your interest is in Reading. Well, uh, it's an interesting one because, as you as you know, and uh, there's been a bit of commentary about, there's obviously very stringent EFL regulations at the moment, and uh, they've been sharpened up in the last few months. So you'll probably be aware that uh, there are quite uh, strict rules on what can be announced regarding takeovers or potential takeovers. Uh, and what can't be discussed. So, I mean, in terms of Reading, I'm happy to talk about the club and, and my views on uh, what, uh, you know, the future could hold. Um, and I'm very happy to talk about Sunderland, Coventry, any any other football matters. But obviously, specifics on a bid, um, I can't discuss um, because obviously there are strict rules around the EFL. But, have, um, very have, have you been in touch with the EFL to clarify what those rules are, though? Well, uh, yes, I have, because I went through the process for Sunderland uh, and Coventry. Um, and it's probably worth noting that the structure put forward for both of those deals uh, was um, indicatively approved by the EFL. So obviously, you know, it, in terms of putting together a deal for any club, EFL approval is a vital part of the process. So clearly you don't want to prejudice that, but uh, very well aware of what they are. And, uh, you know, clearly uh, it's very important for any prospective owner to be availed of those. We're, we understand you haven't actually been in contact with the EFL when it comes to Reading. And, and actually, you spoke a lot there without saying much. That there, There's no restriction on you coming on national radio and telling us if you've made a bid for Reading and if the reports that we believe are false that you've had that bid accepted. That's not breaking any regulations. Have you made a bid and has it been accepted? Have you spoken to the EFL? Well, I don't know who your source is at the EFL, but uh, I, I think they should uh, check their facts. Uh, any prospective owner, and I think we're, we're talking about uh, a prospective deal here, that's the point of the call, uh, would, of course, have been speaking to the EFL. Um, and you thought so. It would be, well, it would be remiss of any prospective owner not to, so clearly your information needs to be double-checked. Um, obviously, EFL approval is, is very, very important. Have and, you made uh, a bid? Has it been accepted? Uh, there are, um, well, I, I can't say on a specific bid. I, what I can say, what I can say very clearly, well, I'll just refer you to my previous comments. But what I can say very clearly, I made a bid for Sunderland. I made a bid for Coventry. Both uh, involved extensive EFL conversations. Clearly, a bid for Reading would include the same. And clearly, we wouldn't be making a bid. Uh, were the EFL process not in hand. So I think that's probably the closest I can say regarding my specific prospective bid, were it to be there. Uh, but I'm very happy to talk about Reading and what, as a prospective owner, I could bring into football, which is extensive. Okay, William, what is it could you bring? Uh, well, where do you start? I mean, new players, new sponsors, commercial revenues... Um, new contacts, innovation. I mean, there's a, there's a huge number of things. If you look at, I am a big, big football fan. I have been for many years. I'm a failed player because I got as far as a, a reserve game for QPR. But if you look at, for example, the best people I would consider the best, uh, you know, chairman and uh, football club owners in the league, people like David Sullivan and Tony Bloom, they've done a phenomenal job in terms of player recruitment, running the club, ensuring there's top management at all levels, uh, and ensure those clubs are run fiscally prudently uh, in a way that's not over leveraged um, and that brings the fans with them you know so I think that's very very important if you look at previous owners of, of various clubs I mean there was people like Mark Goldberg bought Crystal Palace he was a fanatical fan um, but he got absolutely rinsed by agents you look at Tony Fernandez bought QPR same thing put money in was an absolutely rinsed by agents just didn't have a clue Everton recently spent I think it was something like 400 million 
and yet got no results on the pitch as a result of it. And if you're looking at Reading, for example, as a club, you know, you've had an agent there, Kia Jurabchian, who's been involved at QPR and involved at Everton. He's done extremely well. The club haven't. You know, Paul Lintz was there last year. I'm not sure he did a great job. Um, you know, ultimately, recruitment's a big thing, but I think it's an ethos throughout the club. And you've got to have owners and or advisors that actually understand the game and are there for the right reasons. And also, hopefully, are actually fans of the club. You know, I mean, if you look at, um, you know, big clubs who actually bring in club legends, who actually have people who are supporters, I think that makes a huge difference. And even Newcastle now, you know, doing very, very well. One of the key things that I think has kept the fans very much on side, apart from obviously money, has been local kids. You know, it's, there's a core of Geordie players in the team. So, you know, at the end of the day, football is full of all sorts of different characters. But if you're going to own a club, I think you have to understand the area. You have to understand the fans and primarily understand football. Um, and Reading is a number is is among a number of clubs that have been badly run. I don't think that's unfair to say. No. John Medeski was obviously a very prudent manager, uh, sorry, chairman, uh, Mr. Reading. He put all sorts of money in, into the stadium, into the local region. I think he lost a lot of money with the Lehman Brothers thing in Reading Town Centre. And it's a shame for Reading fans that he left but uh, subsequently it's just been a bit of a shambles and clearly from my perspective were I to go into Reading uh, things would be transformed very very quickly. Um, Let me ask you this question because there's a little bit of concern and yesterday we had Kieran Maguire who I know that you've engaged with on social media over the course of the last few months suggesting that some of the previous companies that you've been involved with have uh, been liquidated with millions of pounds worth of debt so when you talk about financial prudence can you understand why there are some who are a little bit concerned well, I think that's our phrase, isn't it? Those that can do and those that can't talk about it. I mean, he's a financial journalist who's ever run a business. So, I mean, I would say with respect that the bloke's utterly clueless. So I did mean, that happen had... or not? Well, I've been involved in multiple companies, many of which have been huge successes, uh, you know, Part of success is failure. There have been some companies that have not done so well. And he has, of course, highlighted those. But at the end of the day, you don't start from nothing and build very successful businesses without a few bloody noses. Now, if he wants to do a fair, objective analysis, then perhaps he wants to talk about the companies that I've created that have had valuations of of up to nine figures. So he, he seems to strangely have omitted those. So at the end of the day, I said to Kieran Maguire, very happy to have a discussion with him. He, he purports to be an expert. Well, experts in the last few years have been largely derided as clueless. Um, and I think Kieran Maguire is following that trend, unfortunately. I think you're spot on, William, when you say that those who can't talk about it. What happened with your sponsorship deal in Formula One? Why did that get terminated early? Great question. Um, I Thank would you very say much. That yeah, Rich Energy uh, is a brand and product I created. We felt it was better than the market leader, better than Red Bull. Red Bull have taken me to court on multiple occasions. They were desperate for me to not to get into Formula One. When we did, they were desperate to get out. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I, I take it as a compliment that the market leader has come after me a number of times. Um, we are working on a return to Formula One. And I think you'll find in due course... That, that Rich Energy will be a very, very competitive product in the marketplace. So we, all your, co- all your contractual obligations were paid. But, were paid. There were no issues in that well, respect. If you go, if you go into the facts of this, um, it's interesting. I have eight lawsuits in this area. I've won seven. I'm on the front foot in the eighth. If you want to actually have a look at Haas, they themselves came out with a statement saying it was an amicable parting of the ways. But I think Haas are desperate not to go against me in law because they will actually owe me a lot of money for defamation. So, you know, again, look at the facts. The, the reality is, if you're a small company and, uh, you know, potentially even a little bit unorthodox, people ask questions. But rather than seeing um, innovation... Um, you know, people are seeing things that aren't there. William, um, just just this, Martin, a former player at Reading. I, I, how can you kind of alleviate the fears of the? To answer that question, though, yes, we did pay Haas for every single race that we did, Good. and you want to ask them that question because a lot of mud has been thrown, but it's not legitimate. And I have a very, very valid case for defamation against them. So very proud of what we did in Formula One, and potentially people need to look at that again and see a very successful small beverage business. They had the temerity to take on Red Bull and, of course, you know, got a lot of mud thrown at us. Will, are you reading from a script there? I just wanted to ask you a question. Certainly as a former, former player, from played for Reading Football Club, lovely football club, great people there. Can you reassure the fans that what's the driver for this? Are you an entrepreneurial? Are you an entrepreneurial business person? Do you love the game? Is it about ego? I'm hearing a lot of ego. 
listening to you talk, and I'm wondering, are you really, and are your pockets big enough? Have you got the money well, to inject into this football club? Or are you I, just going to... Love, listen, I love football. It's about football. I do, of course, have a consumer brand, which I want to promote. And, you know, clearly I would be looking at the Rich Energy Arena. Rich Energy is the shirt sponsor, naturally. But the reality is what I'd like to do is build things. You know, I've not started with anything. I've created everything from nothing. I want to build something successful. I think football is a phenomenal game. If you look at clubs that are available, Reading has a huge amount going for it. It has a fantastic fan base that are motivated and passionate, hence the concern of the last couple of days, which I fully understand. And I think it's really important that somebody that I can speak to them or any prospective owner can speak to the fans and set out their vision for the club. Um, I think it has a superb stadium. Um, a superb infrastructure, Category 1 Academy. Um, it's got some brilliant people involved in the club, including Ruben Seles, who I think is a superb young manager, who retention of him would be a huge priority for any prospective new owner. Um, and I think as a platform, it has all the potential to, to do every bit as well as the likes of Brentford, which, are, you know, are, in my view, a smaller club punching above their weight. So I think what you'd need to do is come in, you'd need to invest, you need to get the right recruitment in place, you'd need to ensure that you didn't have locust agents all around the place um, leeching on the club, and you'd need to ensure you know, real collaboration with the supporters groups to build a vision for Reading. Now, a lot of people, proper football fans, would say, well, where are Reading as a club? That probably their natural place would be somewhere in the middle or to the top of the championship. Clearly, what you would want to do is try and create momentum to try and get into the Premier League. That would clearly be the holy grail. But financial prudence, running it properly... Um, you know, and you'd obviously want a lot of supporters of the club in senior positions that would go the extra mile for the team and the club. OK, so where you talked a lot about investment, you talked about recruitment, you, you talked about ambition there. Where's the money coming from? Is it your money or are you borrowing it? Um, well, I would suggest it's, it's a combination. I mean, it's some, some of my money were, you know, for any prospective football bid, where's the money coming from? Partially myself, partially from investors, um, partially from co commercial partners. But, you know, any bid that I would put together would be fully funded, robust and involve fiscal prudence moving forward. But the reality is, if you were to look at Reading, for example, my understanding is their losses are of the order of 17 million a year. You would need to very, very... Um, quickly look at where those were. You'd need to plug the gaps of working capital and you need to ensure new revenue streams um, and obviously, you know, run run efficiently. But I think the key thing would be to start turning things around on the pitch because momentum on the pitch leads to, you know, increased attendances, you know, an excitement around the club and an ethos of ambition. And I think it's also worth mentioning, if you are talking about Reading, that Di Yonga, who has put in a huge amount of money into the club um, and I think his heart was in the right place or has been in the right place and I think potentially advisors around him you know a la agents um, are probably a bigger part of the problem Okay um, you, you, you talked about Red Bull and them coming after you and being sort of almost a disruptor in a particular market and not necessarily uh, being welcomed in that. We've mentioned some other accusations or concerns about you that have been floated in the last 48 hours or so. Do you think you've been misrepresented? In what context? By do you think, do you think that the, skeptic, the scepticism about this bid is, is misplaced? 100%. I mean, I think it's totally ill-informed. Um, you know, and as I said, uh, ultimately, the facts always come out. Um, listen, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's easy for journalists or, or detractors to have a pop at somebody. Most of my detractors uh, have never met me, um, you know, and I'm not sure I want to meet them. But uh, ultimately, you know, absolutely. I, I'm very, very proud of what we pulled together. I was very disappointed to miss out on Coventry um, because we had something really, really good lined up. Uh, for them, and hopefully, um, you know, we will get a football club very soon, and we can show what we do. Um, we can do. It's, it's about results, isn't it? This this fifty million pound offer that that we read about that you've not confirmed or denied. What would you actually be buying? Because our understanding is that Dai Yong, who you mentioned there, has already moved the training ground and the stadium so that it's owned by separate companies. Are you buying the debt? Are you buying the, the football club? Are you buying the stadium? Are you buying the training ground? Because £50 million for a League One club seems excessive. It would be a record, wouldn't it? 
Well, it's a very leading question, but I'll try and answer it as best I can. I mean, the bottom line is, were one to be considering buying Reading, then obviously you would look at the structure of all those companies and it would be imperative to have the stadium and the infrastructure included. So it may well be, hypothetically, that you'd be buying several businesses involved in one deal uh, because, you know, to build a foundation for success, you would need um, a stadium and training ground and the necessary infrastructure. And the reality is this is in Berkshire, you know, um, it's not in, uh, you know, Sunderland. You know, the price of land is, is very, very different. So obviously, you know, you've got to take that into consideration. Sunderland are a far bigger club than Reading, though, with the greatest respect in the world. Well, they are. Um, they are, they are a, in terms of fan base, I mean, they're one of the biggest in the country and I think they've got among the best fans in the country. Um, but, you know, obviously that's a very different region. Um, but, you know, Reading, as I said, it, it is a club that most people would say has huge potential um, and has the necessary infrastructure to offer that. Um, and I think the um, the ceiling for Reading is very, very high. And I think under the right leadership, they could definitely, definitely get back into the Premier League. And that, you know, realistically, that's going to take potentially three or four years. I'm not, you know, not naive on that, but it would require a lot of commitment. It's a long-term commitment. And I think uh, a point that I would make is it's a football project. It needs people who are really passionate about the game, who are prepared to get involved, who are prepared to put their hands in their pockets and, and really invest for the long term. And that's why the club wouldn't appeal to the usual sort of speculators and spibs that hang around football clubs, um, you know, who are usually interested in, in property elements. This is a football project that requires long term commitment. I think if the right person gets hold of the club, the potential is enormous. Okay. OK, well, listen, um, you said there is quite a lot of potential and you've got a good vision for the club. Let's hope for Reading's sake that it all works out in a positive fashion. And thank you very much for coming on the programme this morning and articulating your vision, uh, potentially, for Reading Football Club. Jim White and Simon Jordan. Monday to Friday mornings from 10 on AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.